welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Jake of Bearded Gear. The Bearded Gear Knife channel on YouTube and Instagram have blown up in the short time they've been around, about two years, something like that. Uh, Jake is a cool cat. His videos showcase, uh, showcase some of the latest and greatest knives before anyone else uh, shows them off. And he offers level-headed yet passionate insight on the gear he reviews. He also hosts a knife podcast on which uh, he and his guests go neck deep in the topic. Uh, but the most recent and exciting news is that Jake and a partner are in the prototyping phase of their very own folding knife. That was a tease. And I'll let you tell, I'll let him tell you all about it in just a second. But first, a word to the wise, like, comment, and subscribe. And if you can't finish this episode in video form, remember to download it to your favorite podcast app. That way you can listen to it on your way to work or while you mow the lawn on Saturday. If you think what we do here is valuable, you want to help support the show while enjoying interview extras, knife giveaways, stickers, early access to the show, and more, you can do so on Patreon. Uh, the quickest way to get there is to head over to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Now, again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Do you use terms like handle the blade ratio, walk and talk, hair pop and sharp, or tank like? Then you are a dork and a knife junkie. Jake, welcome to the show. Good to have you back, sir. Thank you so much for having me. I, uh, I This is sooner than I expected to be back, and I appreciate that. I loved being on your podcast the first time, so it's an honor to be re-invited. I'm, I'm personally <laughs> grateful. Oh, well, whenever, I don't know, this is, you got some exciting news. You got some exciting things happening, big developments, and uh, it's, it feels like it, it merits a conversation. And uh, I, I'd love to, I'd love to find out, dig in, find out about this whole process of developing a knife company and a knife. But first, for people who maybe didn't listen to episode 174 and didn't uh, hear that first interview, just quickly tell us about the channel. Tell us about Bearded Gear, how you got it started, and how you approach it. Sure. So Bearded Gear, the YouTube channel, was created as uh, basically in result of the pandemic. Um, I was furloughed for my job. I'd been in the knife community for a couple of years, mostly on Instagram, just sharing photos and I'd been buying, selling and trading and enjoying the hobby in that way. Um, and I'd thought about making a YouTube channel for quite a while. I just, it, it seemed like something I would like doing. I've been in like content creation semi-professionally and sometimes professionally for years. So as soon as I was furloughed, I had the time, uh, that would have been March of what's that 2020. So a year and a half ish ago. And, uh, I just kind of hit the ground running. I, wanted to establish a whole library of content quickly. So I was posting tons of videos and um, just kind of created a, a whole channel behind it. So I, I switched my Instagram name to Bearded Gear at the same time, been pushing that, firing on all cylinders and just posting videos and images. And it's primarily reviews. I, I mostly just review knives. That's <laughs> the bulk of my videos, all there are some random odds and ends of things that I find interesting that I'll toss reviews in because I enjoy them. Um, and then the podcast stemmed from that. I think I'm about 30 episodes deep on the podcast. I've been slacking on it lately, but, um, yeah, it's been, it's been a fun ride. I have been lucky that a lot of people have subscribed and seem to like watching. I was just having a conversation today with a buddy about how it's kind of surprising to me because the whole, vibe of my channel the way that i approach it is just in like the most natural way possible i just call it the way i see it and i like whether that's harsh or whether that's overly kind or whatever it may be like come what may i just try to remain authentic in it and i didn't know if people would like that as much as more like high production quality or salesy or marketing feeling things like it's just very much me most videos are more my face than they are the knife. It's me talking about things. And um, luckily, some people like that. Tons of people 
would rather see the knife than my face and then let me know in the comments. But um, there are a good bulk of people who seem to enjoy the vlog style that I do. And it's been fun. It's been a lot of uh, just a good time. Uh, I was thinking earlier today about uh, why I like your channel and I was mad, you know, kind of thinking, well, he's been around not for very long at all and has gone gambusters. What is it about him? Yes, it is. You know, the content uh, ultimately you do present like all the great new knives coming out. Uh, we see them on your channel almost before anyone else, frequently before anyone else, at least I do with the people I'm subscribed to. And uh, I'm subscribed to an embarrassingly uh, huge amount of knife people. Um, but uh, yes, your vibe, your personality, um, your authenticity, and just your sort of, it's not off the cuff. It's obvious you've thought about this stuff, but uh, uh, I, I really think that's a big thing. But another aspect is, and this hooked me er early on, is when you do videos outside, some of the greats, you know, we, we stand on the shoulder of giants and some of the greats like... Uh, a nut and fancy and uh, who was it uh, Gideon's tactical and some of these other guys go out in the woods like you do go out to these beautiful locations you know I live in suburban DC uh, and there's a lot of beauty around here for sure but I don't see canyons I don't see what you see so you right. also take people out on hikes with you yeah I uh, I feel bad that I've been slacking so much on that and I know a ton of my subscribers and followers love that content and frankly it's just been way too hot lately <laughs> like, uh, like today it was literally I think 99 yesterday I got up to 101 and I, I'm not an early riser these days with my schedule I'm more of like stay up super late editing video kind of guy um, so I don't get up early enough to avoid the heat and it's been far too long. I think I've only posted two outdoor knife reviews in the last couple of months, which is a shame because those are my favorite videos to film. When my channel started, it was like, I don't know, almost unfair that it was like, I was just kind of taking my hobby to the next level. And my other like passion is hiking. I am an avid mm -hmm. hiker. I love it. Um, and so to blend the two was like, kind of a, a dream come true that I was able to like do something that was productive on paper. Like I was getting something done when I was coming back from my hike with a bunch of videos on the SD card. But really I was also just like, it was an excuse to hike a lot more. Um, and it worked, it worked really well, but yeah, then life gets in the way sometimes. But as soon as the weather cools down, there's going to be a lot more on trail videos because those are my favorite to film. It's, and I feel like my thoughts are clearest when I'm out there because there's just zero distractions. Even when I have the house to myself and I'm shooting video, it's like, I don't know, my mind works better when I'm out in open spaces and looking at cool things. Yeah. And you're moving around and your blood is flowing in a different way. And, and uh, yeah, you've got all that nature around you to inspire you. Um, so what in, in the, in the period of time you've been doing this, I, I, I gave you uh, two years, but it's been even less um, in the period of time you've been doing this. Um, I would imagine making these videos has focused your thoughts a lot. What have you learned about knives? That's a huge question. What have you learned about your relationship to knives and what you like and what you've grown to value? Sure. So, yeah, that's a loaded question, no matter how narrowly you try to slice it for how much, <laughs> how much time <laughs> I spend thinking about knives. Um, I think really it's just helped me to identify my preferences more and more mm -hmm. and what features I thought didn't bother me that do like, as soon as I learned that there was something else, if that makes sense, like I grew up on pretty good knives. I I'm lucky that knives have been a, a focus point of my life pretty much all the way through because my dad was into knives and my brothers were into knives. And, um, I went to gun shows looking to buy knives and like I've, I've had knives around my entire life, but I feel like I, I was, blind to so much of what was actually out there, even at the time. And then now we're in this seemingly kind of heyday. I think it was Alex Steingraber, who I recently heard mention that he thinks we're at the beginning of a knife renaissance. And I agree with that. There's so much happening and so many new designers and so many existing designers who are trying new things and perfecting their craft and material science has come a long way and mm -hmm. manufacturing has come a long way. And so all these things are kind of coming to what seems to be a, a new height, but I was missing a lot of it before reviewing because I just wasn't experiencing as much of it. And 
the whole way along with my channel, I've only really reviewed things that interest me. I don't pick up things just because they're coming out mm -hmm. or just because they're new. Sometimes there's hype around it and I fall for hype just like anybody else does. And that's what gets me excited. But um, through like just trying segment after segment and brand after brand, I've, I've been able to better identify like, I just don't like that feature. I thought I was okay with it. Or maybe sometimes there's features that I thought bothered me and then I try carrying a knife for a week that has a certain thing about it that I thought I wouldn't like and I find out it doesn't bother me. And so I've just been able to identify more and more what works for my hand, what works for my pocket, what works for the tasks I do. And then, yeah, a whole lot more beyond that. But that's probably been the biggest thing is just narrowing, narrowing down <laughs> and distilling what I'm into. Okay. So narrowing down and distilling, you know, I talked about this before and uh, you were kind enough to send this along for me to check out. Uh, and this is the prototype to your knife, your knife with a partner. And, I, and we'll go into that in a second. The uh, Avant by Luft Concepts. That's the name of your your new knife, or that's the name of Jake's new knife company. I don't have to tell you, Jake, I think you know that, but you were talking, you know, I asked you, <laughs> oh my God, look, what a handsome pair. I asked you what you find ideal. And then I realized it's sitting right in front of me. Most, most uh, probably. Uh, and so tell me what went into this design and, and, and before you do, can I just make some observations about this? By all means. In fact, I was going to suggest that before I talk about it, I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. Cause one of my favorite things about creating a knife, like not just designing it, but now having tangible prototypes, mm -hmm. we've done a pre-order. So if you're listening to this, I'm sorry. And if you want one, not yet, there will be some that go to retail. That's a whole thing we can get into. But um, while having these prototypes, one of my favorite things has been handing them to other knife people and just without guiding the conversation other than handing them the knife, just seeing what they have to say about it. And at USN, I got to hand it to like Richard Rogers and Enrique Pena oh, and like a bunch of knife makers and designers that I really like. Yeah. Uh, the guys from Keenison, Brian checked it out and like a lot of knife guys whose opinions yeah. I respect and hearing what each individual has to say, oftentimes being pretty different from one another is way too much fun for me. So oh, before yeah. I jump into what I did to it, let me know what you think of it. Okay. So, so uh, what I will do is uh, uh, when I make my review video of this, because I want to make a video of this, not a review video, a close up. And then b before I send it back to you, um, and, and I'll, I'll go in deep in more depth here because people want to hear you right now. But I, I just have to congratulate you on this knife for, for a couple of things. First of all, uh, I, and I'm just going to rattle off in no particular order. I love the low profile flipper tab. I, I am smitten with the straight razor of a blade you put on here with a point. I mean, this thing is deeply hollow ground and so thin. Uh, it, it's astounding. I mean, so much so that when I first got it, I looked at it, I was like, does this have an actual secondary edge? Like, it, you know, the edge has to, doesn't have to be very big because it's on such a thin surface here. So, so it took, and then, and then, you know, making tiny, tiny curls with paper, I saw, oh yeah, it has an edge. It's just barely perceptible by the eye because it gets so thin. Um, I love the opening method and I love the sound. I'm sure people are commenting on this. I've tried to avoid the videos, but that, that sound right there. Yep. And that's just the sound of this really thinly ground blade tinging open. Uh, I, uh, the handle, I like it's, it's a bit, um, I get uh, some of the wedginess uh, from a strider here yet uh, way more comfortable uh, in my opinion. Uh, this area right around in here, um, the way the space is dealt with around the pivot and the choil reminds me a bit of a paramilitary, even though this has a choil and all this, stuff. but it, but it, but that same sort of uh, feel where you can choke up. I really like, um, I, I love the materials used and, uh, and, and I'll go in, like I said, greater depth in the video, but I, I think this is a really, uh, oh, and the crown spine. I'm a sucker for a, a crown spine. Um, and the first thing I thought was like, oh, it's Italian. <laughs> and 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 I, I don't know. I, I don't know about, uh, we're, we're going to find out all about the prototyping process, but that was my first thought. It's smooth. It's cool with that, with that crown spine. So anyway, sorry, I've gone on at length. Um, I'm really impressed with this. T tell me about your partnership and how this whole thing started. 
Yeah. So uh, my partner is named Ryan, Ryan Rimmer, and he's a, a good, good buddy, um, a, a relationship. We actually did a podcast on my platform where I tried to highlight him pretty well in the podcast. It was us telling the story of Luft, but um, people know me better than they know him because he's not on YouTube. He is on Instagram. Um, most people would know him from Rimmer Designs. He's a maker. He makes um oh i left mine in the car i think he makes these things called worry donuts uh, some people have probably seen them it's like a donut shaped totem that people just carry with them and i make fun of them a lot even though i have one because I'd, i'm not into that kind of stuff um but he just he likes making for fun and that's what he makes um and he just reached out to me randomly when my channel was still pretty new and I think he was asking a question about one of the videos I had made, um, whatever knife I was talking about at the time. And we just started a pretty natural conversation. And then over a couple of weeks, we were talking like just about every day and kind of confided in each other. We had, we had both been really interested in the idea of designing our own knife, um, but it seemed pretty overwhelming. <laughs> and so mm. we were just like, why don't we take a shot at it kind of together. We'll start by just like coming up with a couple of drawings. If we feel like we have something worth building on, we'll hop on a Zoom call. And uh, Ryan pretty quickly drew something up. But I was pretty busy at the time. I was had gone back to work for a little bit. It was before I quit my job to do YouTube full time for a while. Anyways, um, he sent me a, a picture of this drawing that frankly was not great. <laughs> um, and he would admit that it was like, it, it was in terms of like his artistic ability, it was drawn pretty well, but the knife, if it had been, that wouldn't have been a great knife in my opinion. And so I was like, it, it's a starting point. Why don't we just riff on it a little bit? And so I kind of like drew on his drawing electronically if that makes sense and like why don't you try this to this line this to here move that to there and we'll see what it looks like and then he did that and then it got a little better and then he started putting it into 2d cad so that it could move and we could figure out where stuff would go and then over a couple of zoom calls it just got to a point where we were both like this actually looks kind of good and so we kept going with it and we just kept back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And we are both really good, especially with each other at just being pretty harsh. <laughs> and mm -hmm. like, it's a safe space between the two of us where if we don't like something, either of us can very easily be like, no, 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 no. And then as long as we explain it well, we usually get the other one on board because we agree on a lot. Mm -hmm. So we just kept ripping until it became the design that we really liked. And then we got to a point where it was like, I would want that knife. I'd want it in my pocket. It's like, seems like a pretty ideal knife to carry and use. And so neither of us knew how to do 3D CAD. So we reached out to my buddy, Wes Newman. He goes by the pocket perspective. Uh, he has a YouTube oh. channel and great guy. And he has worked in like the, the for AutoCAD, I think like in the industry, like for <laughs> the business oh. who makes the CAD software yeah. for forever. And so he's a wizard with it. And so we paid him to take our 2D drawing that was pretty rudimentary and make it a 3D functional working CAD file that could be used by essentially anybody that we wanted to take it to at that point. And with that, he also had the capability to 3D print. So he 3D printed us some plastic models of the mm. night and sent them out with hardware and everything. He's phenomenal. I can't recommend him enough. Um, and then with those 3D printed models, we basically realized some little tweaks we needed to make, um, just some ergonomic things that would make it a little bit better. And so that was a crucial step because if you just look at it on the computer, there's certain things you can't sense, you know? And yeah. so with those models, we made a couple of changes, hopped on a Zoom call with Wes, move this here, move that there, let's do this. And then he reprinted um, what needed to be reprinted component wise, sent it back out to us. We confirmed we loved it. And then it was like, great, now we have a 3D file. What do we do? And basically the decision was, do we take this to someone from the perspective of wanting them to license it? And then we collect a royalty or whatever on any unit that they sell, but it's their knife now. We've sold it to them, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Or do we take it all the way and find an OEM who will build it for us. And then we create a company and we market it and we sell it and all of that, all the above. And it was like, 
I mean, we kind of wanted to do it for fun and for the experience of it. And because we were nerds about it, it seemed like we were cheating ourselves out of a lot of that if we just like took it that far and then gave it away. Um, so we just made a pact. We were like, all right, let's pick an OEM. And pretty immediately, both of us, especially because of all the reviewing that I've done and all the knives that Ryan has owned, we were both in agreement that React was the best choice. And luckily, <laughs> React was able to take us. I know a lot of people are just not even getting to work with them right now because they're so busy. But mm -hmm. timing was right. We got in with React. They created these prototypes for us. It took a while, but they made them. Um, and then based off of these prototypes, I showed it on my channel. We sent it to a few of my friends' channels, um, and they reviewed it as well, showed it off, and then we launched a pre-order. We sold out in nine hours, which is amazing for a first Congratulations. product awesome. ever. Yeah, it's wild, like beyond our expectations for sure. Um, and now we wait. Now is the hardest part where <laughs> we wait until... It's looking like probably early February we'll have production in hand. And then I got to fly out to Texas where Ryan is. And we're going to have a QC and packaging party and all that and get everything ready. But um, probably mid to late February, we'll have these knives and the 300 people who ordered them into wow. their hands. And then some units to go to retailers as well, which would be really cool. Is Are there variations to this theme or are they all black micarta? And what what's the steel and... Some of the yeah, so both versions are going to be M390 and Micarta with all titanium liners and hardware, everything. Um, there's this variant, which is satin, blade finish, and black Micarta. Um, in production, the hardware isn't going to be this like shiny satin that it is here. It's going to actually match the backspacer, which is oh, a little okay. bit more of a... Um, like a blasted finish. So that'll be version A, if you want to call it that. And then the other variation is OD Green Micarta with a PVD black coated blade oh, and yeah. all PVD hardware, liners, clip, everything. So everything will be black on that version mm -hmm. other than the scales, which are dark green, uh, which looks pretty cool in my opinion. Um, according to the pre-orders, this is the more popular one. This one sold out way faster than the other version, but I personally prefer the PVD variant. Um, if I had one of the prototypes here, I'd show you, but it's loaned out. So, okay. Yeah. What a hard choice. Uh, that's going to be because, uh, I love the combination of the black blade with the green handle. Uh, it just speaks to me, but what else speaks to me, uh, what also speaks to me is the uh, machine sat in the Riyadh. The grind days. lines. Oh my yeah. God. I love their, yeah, I, I, I can stare all day at their blades. And uh, when it's uh, unsullied by PVD, I think it's probably, uh, I don't know, it's my favorite way, but who knows? Maybe I guess I have to get both. Uh, I don't know how that works. There are a few people who did that for sure. And I bet some of them plan to make an all black version and then throw the green scales on this or, you know, there's uh, people will do what they're going to do. And we, we don't want to discourage modding. Um, but yeah, so that'll be the first run. And then we're currently trying to finalize what we're going to do for a second run. We have time. It's not like we have to place an order immediately, but, um, we've been pretty transparent the whole way along that we plan for our next order to be a much shorter pre-order process mm -hmm. because with the profit we've made on this first pre-order, um, we're not taking any money out. We're just trying to build the business. So we're going to place another order with that profit at which people won't have to pre-order six months <laughs> before they get the knife. Gotcha. It'll hopefully be more like a month or two before they get the knife on that one because we have the advantage of having some some power now. Um, but yeah, in that one, I know we're planning to do a titanium version. That's for sure. Um, I'll, I'll keep the specifics out of it for now because it's not totally decided. Um, and then there'll be at least one other variation that'll be different from what this first run was. And so we plan to do a variety of iterations of the Avant. We like the platform and there's just a lot about this knife that we love. And so the first run being M390, Micarta, Titanium feels very right to us, especially coming in. It's just under three ounces. It's a featherweight for its size. Like it's a great balanced EDC knife. And now we get to riff on it and be like, but what if we did this, you know, and, and play with it a little. Yeah. Like you, like you said, it's a, it's a perfect platform for that. Yeah. Um, you know, when I first got this, uh, when I, when you first sent this to me, I was under the impression 
that it was linerless on the on the show side and they do such a man they are amazing i yeah, mean the way they 50 percent of people who've done their first impressions videos have said oh yeah and it's a, a liner just on the lock side and then it's just my card on the show side and then yeah. i always have to message them be like no 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 there's yeah. a full nested titanium liner on both sides it's just really lightweight yeah it's just like it's perfectly perfectly done that's really that. for you <laughs> yeah yeah no kidding so uh what about this process uh have you so far because you're not all the way through the process but you're you're a, a good deal of the way through what has been your favorite part and and uh like has this given you some new respect for for knife knife makers and knife companies and such yeah i think honestly the whole thing has been really fun because we set out to do it kind of for fun. Like we were both serious about it and the company where we've created around it. I don't want to say like, this is all fun and games. Like we could be gone tomorrow because we, we certainly intend for this to be a real thing with longevity. Right. Um, but the whole thing has been about two buddies kind of just like live in the dream a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and I, yeah, if I were to highlight a part that's been just like, incredible beyond everything else it's the moment when the physical real prototypes arrived because like i've drawn like doodled a million knives in my lifetime mm -hmm. like i probably should have gotten in way bigger trouble in school as a kid because the things that i was drawing were knives and sometimes guns like it's yeah. just what my brain wants to do to, to get thoughts out right and so to take that to a next step and then draw one that got far enough to be like working and mechanically sound was cool to have like even just a 2d file of like, Oh wow, this is a, a drawing that came kind of to life. And then to make it 3d was wild. And then to get a 3d printed prototype was wild, but to get a physical tangible knife in the right materials that I could personally put in my pocket. And this has been my personal prototype. This hasn't gone to anybody else. I've just been, carrying and using it like crazy a to test it but b because it's like it's wild to have my own knife in my own pocket yeah. after being a fan <laughs> for the whole way through my life to then go and, and be like a different type of participant in it is right. it's, it's surreal uh we were talking about the liners and we were also talking about the lightweight uh nature of it but uh and i want to ask you about that but but how did you learn all of the like how to actually uh design and engineer the guts the locking uh all that geometry what was that that like um so we had a couple of really generous people help us a little bit uh, we didn't ask for too much help because both of us wanted to nerd out so much mm -hmm. that we wanted to like authentically do it ourselves, but we got pointers from people that were really helpful. Um, at the time that we were designing, Ryan was helping out a lot at the Keenis and knives shop. Uh, mm -hmm. he lives out near them in Texas and at the time was between jobs. So he had a bunch of free time and he would literally just go over there a lot and help them with whatever they needed help with because he wanted to learn. And the guys at Keenis and explained a lot to him, especially as we got to that point, Brian was really helpful at just talking Ryan through some basics of like, make sure you do this, make sure you don't do that. And that helped. And then Wes who did our 3d, um, was also really helpful. We had it at a point where we knew it, it made sense and none of like knife making at, at least surface level, something relatively simple, like making a liner lock, like a ton of people have before none of it's that secretive right? Mm -hmm. Like most people, there's books on it. You can just, it's free information how the mechanism is supposed to work. But you do also with every different knife design have unique challenges based on where you're going to put things so that they all make sense and they all line up and that it locks up solid and doesn't have play and all those things. So it was a lot of moving things around <laughs> to get it to where we thought it was perfect. And then it was a little bit of confirming that with people who had done it before and luckily like i said wes who did our 3d he's literally designed some of his own designs he's helped with a lot of people who've done other designs so in that kind of final phase of like getting the 3d just right he was able to like uh, we should move that a hair this way and it's like okay <laughs> great you, right you he had the, uh, that experience that you could trust and draw on yeah what was it like working with riyat or riyat 
how do they pronounce it? First of all, I always say Riyadh, but you said Riyadh. Is that how they say it? I'm curious. I don't know that I've heard the word come out of any of their Like when mouths. they answer the phone. <laughs> um, yeah, I always say Riyadh. I think that's okay. just because that's what I hear other people say. But I've yeah. also, yeah, I don't know. I've heard Riyadh. I don't know. Um, it, they've been great. So the biggest challenge with them in particular, I can speak because we're using them, is time. <laughs> um, and I know a lot of OEMs have long wait times right now. And some of them are even so busy that they're not taking on new people, which is unfortunate, but also awesome as an indicator of the knife industry is doing well if a lot of people are using the OEMs to create their production runs. But yeah, it's it's just a waiting game is the hardest part. And when you're excited about something, waiting feels even longer. So it's just, yeah, they're really good internally at like when we sent them our file, first of all, there were like specific contracts and NDAs and stuff to make sure that our intellectual property was safe with them. And that, yeah, it, it was a, a legitimate business agreement that felt mm -hmm. pretty comfortable compared to just like, here's our file. What do you think you can do? You know, so their yeah. level of professionalism was really good. Um, I actually was lucky. I got introduced to them through one of their U S contacts, a guy who's here and actually lives not far from me in Southern California. So talking to him on the phone is super easy because we're in the same time zone. He obviously mm -hmm. has great command of the English language since he's American. Um, <laughs> and so that was helpful. And yeah, it's just a lot of like back and forth. We send the file, they have to make it theirs so that they can machine it and actually manufacture it. So they want to okay little tweaks and slight changes. And um, it was all pretty good communication. It's they're on the other side of the earth. So sometimes right. <laughs> timing isn't fun. And then, and then it's just waiting. It's a lot of waiting um, and paying, you have to pay them to do it because we aren't licensing this to them. We're paying to have them produce it for us. And so it's, it's not cheap and it costs a lot of time as well, but right. overall they're top notch. And there's a reason why a lot of people work with them. And luckily, like with my podcast, I've spoken with a number of designers and makers who use them for production runs and been able to talk to them and pick their brains about it. So I had kind of an unfair amount of information going into it compared to somebody who's just thinking about it for the first time, you know? Yeah. So, uh, it's, it's interesting to know that they're great to work with. I guess that's, uh, uh, it's not a given, but, but their product is so, so excellent that, uh, it's good to hear. And I'm, I guess I'm not surprised to hear that there. So when, when a company like Riyadh, um, takes your design, um, and, they, like you said, they have to make it their own. I guess, I guess that means they have to translate it into whatever program they're using and mm -hmm. get it ready for their machines and their computer systems and all that. And you mentioned little tweaks when they came back to you with tweaks, what kind of tweaks were they? Were they internal gut kind of things? What was it? Yeah. I mean, just really simple. Like in our 3d file, the hardware looked a little different. They don't use hardware based on our random drawing, right? They use hardware based on <laughs> what they actually can source or make. Um, and so like the hardware needed to change. The mm -hmm. final placement of the clip um, had to move just a hair compared to where we had it just to clear the final body screw. Um, really small things that were yeah, just them actually being the ones who make the knives. They were like, if if we do this, it makes way more sense for us. And I think some people, frankly, will send React maybe a 2D file or maybe even just a drawing. Um, mm -hmm. And React will kind of do the work for them. A lot of OEMs will, where they'll take that drawing and then they'll create the 3D for it. And I think that's a legitimate way to do it. But I'm really glad we did as much as we did before sending it to them and having it become a full 3d working CAD file that we were like on the zoom call directing and watching things move and making sure it was exactly our vision because I fear there would have been a little more lost in that process of like, take this drawing and make it real. Um, if it was them doing it compared to me, like being on a zoom call with Wes, cause that's not the way it works with an OEM. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I mean that, that, uh, that really is an advantage to know that before you send anything to an OEM like that, that you've already had some real, you know, professionals in your corner 
helping you make sure that it's ready to go so that so that when they do come back to you with tweaks it is that it's like oh well here here at react we need to move the clip down here so that it fits here and it's not a big deal right it's, it's not like they're you're sending them something scrawled on a napkin they're like this this pivot area will never work it's got to look right. like uh, I've the whole spoken... essence of the design could change if you leave it that gray. Yes, exactly. Exactly. I've spoken to a number of people who, uh, you know, were custom knife makers and then took the shift into production and didn't really have the background or the chops with the, uh, with the CAD and then things get changed and it becomes a lot more back and forth, back and forth until everybody's happy. Yeah. Yeah. Luckily our design was pretty sound. So it was mostly like, couple little tweaks once it was our turn in line to be the one who has their designer <laughs> in-house working on it. There was waiting before that. Uh, again, another evidence of waiting being the hard part. But yeah, right. once they were working on it, it was like, great, bada bing, bada boom. We nail it down. And then it was like, we have to pick exactly what configurations we want based on what materials they have available mm -hmm. to make our knife in. Um, so that was a whole decision-making process. And what colors do we want? Do we want coded? Do we want anything not coded? You know, like all of these things, where do we want laser markings to be? All of that has to be decided. And the good thing is when it's yours and it's an OEM project, you can make all of those decisions and some cost more than others. Some take longer than others, but that ball is totally in your court. Whereas if you're licensing the design, you could send them a drawing and then they could decide to tweak more than you would want to be tweaked in a lot of cases. And they could, all right, we really like this, but we're going to move things around yeah. more than the designer would like to have. And then they choose where they place it based on materials and pricing and all that. And it might not be your vision. You may end up with a budget version of a knife that you think deserves to be the creme de la creme, you right. know? And oh, man. So it's, it's nice to be in the driver's seat and working with React, we have been, which is the best thing. Yeah. You know, you could end up with a, with a circular opening hole on this if, if, if it went, you know, a certain way. So uh, I think this looks better with this long, weirdly shaped uh, hole. And by the way, uh, this is great for, I mean, just, you can tell that this was designed by serious knife enthusiasts because you know there's there's not a way you can't this is my favorite i just like the thumb opening you know um but you can open this up in so many different ways and um you know i know you said carry it with you and use it but i can't bring myself to do that because it's a prototype and you know man who if, if somehow I lost it, that would be, that'd be the worst. It's a calculated risk as the person who's sending prototypes out. I so know. this one isn't leaving my possession. Um, I got that one specifically as an extra and I was supposed to have two of the green and black variant as well, but something happened in prototyping and one of them broke. Um, oh, at, at, still with me at, so, um, we got, two of this one for me and then one of the other. And then Ryan has one of each, but the whole plan all along with me being the one with a YouTube channel and a bunch of buddies who also do it was for me to send prototypes around. So yeah. the unfortunate thing is that I don't have one of each here, but yeah, I mean the, the most important thing about that prototype is that people are experiencing it and then can add validity to our story. Cause we're trying to tell a story behind it and it's only so powerful if I tell it because obviously I'm the most biased person on the yeah. earth. Yeah. Yeah tied only with Ryan, right? Like right. We, we, everything we say about it has to be filtered by people as being like, it's going to be salesy because we're the ones who created it. Well, yeah. And there's no way I can remove that. So by sending it to people and encouraging them to use it and carry it and then talk honestly about it, I welcome it. And not all the reviews have been like, this is everyone's most perfect knife. They've all been positive, which I'm proud to say, but yeah people are allowed to disagree with design choices that I made because Ryan and I made this to be our perfect knife and not everybody has the same taste. So right. the feedback is good. It's nice to hear that some people have things that they'd change about it. And that's all stuff we're listening to. Uh, tell me about Luft concepts. Luft, uh, you and I had a, uh, a little uh, exchange text ex exchange. Um, and I said, Luft, uh, means air in German, which obviously you are well aware of. And I was like, that's yeah. an apt name because this thing is so light. Uh, but tell me about the name and, and the mission of your company as you and Ryan see it, you know, moving forward. Yeah. So simultaneous to Ryan and I bonding over knives, we also bonded over our love of cars. Um, we're both just gearheads who 
enjoy cars. We're enthusiasts. And uh, specifically, we bonded over our love of German cars, classic air-cooled Porsches, Audis, um, and uh, just a lot of German car culture we find very fun and exciting. And the cars that we lust after are often within that segment. <laughs> so um, when we were trying to decide on the name for the company, it was like, it's uh, naming things in general can be kind of difficult, <laughs> um, especially when it's something that you plan on like sticking around for a long time yeah. because you don't want to just name it whatever, you know, and it, it felt meaningful to be naming, naming something that's our first knife company. That's a big deal to both of us. So we wanted it to be something that we had bonded over and we pretty immediately kind of decided on cars being the thing that we could use as our, like our focus point. Mm -hmm. um, and so it just, it became like, I don't, I don't even know. I'd have to really retrace my steps back through that conversation to figure out how we exactly landed on Luft. But I think basically it was like, we wanted it to be kind of like Porsche related because we really like the branding of Porsche and like even their vintage advertisements and stuff we find mm -hmm. really intriguing. And so then I've been to a number of car shows here in Southern California called Luftgekult, um, which just means air-cooled, I think, in German. <laughs> and it's only air-cooled Porsches that are allowed to display. And it's one of the coolest events to go to. They Every year when they do it, they house it in a different place. The last one I went to is at a giant lumber yard. And so each time it's in a different place, but the, the Porsches are set in this environment where like they just have a really unique backdrop because mm. they're in these big, not typical car meet, like parking lot type of places. And so photography there is super fun and it's just, it's a really cool car meet. And so I was like, what if we just shortened that down and took just the word for air, which if you're not into cars is still like air could mean a ton of things, right? Yeah. <laughs> air is not offensive. Um, and so <laughs> we were like, great. It's a four letter word. It looks cool. It sounds cool. Let's go with that. And so we did, and we created uh, the logo around it. I feel like I should have a sticker here, but I don't. Um, it's just the alchemy symbol for air, basically. Oh. <laughs> it's a triangle with a line through it. Just it's, means air. It's on the uh, it's on the flipper tab. I don't yeah, there you go. If I had um, my knife cam up, we could show it, but. Uh... You're good. So yeah, we created the logo around it. And then when naming the knife, first of all, we plan to name all of our knives after German cars in some way. It doesn't have to be so literal that it's like named the car name itself, but a nod to a certain car in each case. And Avant is uh, Audi's name for wagons. <laughs> That's what they call their station wagons. And the lines of the Avant seemed a little bit reminiscent of the RS6 and some famous Audi wagons with kind of the slope back here. Um, oh, it's not exact, but it's no, like, no, I see what you're saying. It's, it was just like, it made us think of if we were to call this a, a car in modern German cars, like what would it be? And so we liked the idea of that. And uh, so we went with it and yeah, both of us, the RS six is a specific, another car that we've really bonded over wanting. <laughs> and so it was fun to like name the knife after that. And it's all just been kind of a play on us being friends too, which is fun. Yeah. And, the and you know, like I said before, and it's, it's, it might not be true with everything you guys end up producing, but it's, you know, it's apropos to, to the, to the knife itself. It's a light, it's, it's not a lightweight, it's a heavy hitter, but it's a, it's light in the pocket. It's light in the hand. It feels, um, refined, you know, when you, when you hold it and you open it and you, and you use it, uh, like I said, I've only used it in the confines of this room. Basically, you better use it a little more before you send it on. Uh, all right, I will. I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it out with me into the into the world. Uh, but uh, this is great for cutting paper, and I don't just mean uh, you know cutting paper to test. Uh, this is great for arts and crafts with the daughters. It's so thin on a on a cutting mat. That's one of my. That's one of the main uses of. You know what I haven't done with this is sharpen pencils. That's always my do it there you so, go something i do a lot with it and and the thinner the grind the better yeah i'm glad the edge on that one in particular is still doing all right too because it's been through it started with kevin or no kyle from dtom knives and gear went to kevin left edc then it went to chris from grady's gear went from him to 
um, Everyday Minimalist, and then from Everyday Minimalist to EDC Gear Reviews, and then to Stasa. So Stasa, six right. people before you, and each of them used and carried it and cut with it. And by the time it left EDC Gear Reviews, he said that the edge seemed like it could use a sharpening, but he didn't have time. And then he mm -hmm. sent it to Stasa. And Stasa, I'm sure, would have sharpened it, but the hurricane was happening while he had it. And so I think he just dropped it. That's all I did with it too, is just with, drop it with a little bit, of, little bit of green medium. And uh, yeah, it's real. Right before we started rolling, I was doing, you know, these little tiny little curls on the edge of my paper. And I don't know, I find that very gratifying, you know, just to feel it slip between the atoms, you know, and make a little curl. Yeah. And a thin behind the edge profile is magical in the sense that even when, the knife starts to lose it's like the real bite of its edge yeah. it'll still slice through things like paper and cardboard fairly well just on geometry alone right. just kind of a, a hack of a knife feeling sharp i guess but you think of like uh my steingraber performance shark i know yes. i already mentioned alex before like yeah. that knife with no edge on it will process cardboard just right. because it's such thin <laughs> geometry yeah. um so and it also keeps the edge longer when it doesn't have a ton of material behind it creating more friction so yeah, we, uh, we're really happy with where they got this grind. We were on the fence. One of the big design decisions was, do we make this a full flat grind or do we do a hollow grind? And really it came down to like, we wanted this stock thickness because that felt right for the design. Mm -hmm. And then we our target behind the edge thinness was really only achievable with the hollow grind. So all yeah. that geometry came out of function. So it looks the way it does in terms of grind so that we could get the behind the edge profile that we did and they nailed it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it's really, I mean, uh, I, I'm not, I'm not over, I'm not exaggerating, exaggerating when I say that it really does have the feel of a straight razor. It is so thin and it feels like you could sharpen it up to nearly the, the opening hole and you'd still be able to get an edge on this. Yeah. Um, what, what are, what is the Luft concepts kind of, um, I don't know, design mission. What are, what are you looking, what do you want, you know, in 10 years when you have a body of work, mm -hmm. what do you want that body of work to represent? Um, I think it's, it's kind of a dichotomy. If you were to ask both Ryan and I, I'm confident that our answer would be the same about this because we're incredibly serious about the knives, right? Like we're both passionate about knives and we only want to design things that we actually want in our pockets. Neither of us have any interest in designing like, oh, because really small knives are hot right now, we need to design a really small knife. No, I, I don't care to design things because that's what the market is buying in this moment. Um, we're just designing the things that we selfishly want. And if people want them too, great. The units will sell and we'll make more of them. But there's going to be a, a pretty big difference, I think, from model to model. Um, there will be certainly some similarities. We intend to make our knives feel a little bit like a family and have certain features that carry over and people will be able to tell it's a luft knife. But there's there's also going to be some pretty stark contrast. So it's not just going to be like, oh, we're going to make an Avant, but we'll put a Warncliffe blade on it and everything else will remain the same. If we're going to make an Avant, Ryan and I have talked, or if we're going to make a Warney, Ryan and I have talked about this it doesn't have to be the Avant still. They can share similarities to the Avant, but we don't just want to like keep riffing on the same design and, and barely tweaking it. We want to do very different things that feel like if we're making a Warncliffe, it should be the best that a Warncliffe could be within that platform, not just a tweak on something else we've done. And so we're looking at everything in kind of a fresh way. And we have some other designs drawn that are frankly pretty much ready if we were ready to pull the trigger on them, but we're letting the Avant have its time to shine. We're not sure. even showing those or like, we're not even gonna selfishly prototype them for a while because then we know we'll get trigger happy and wanna show people. But um, our other design work that we've collaborated on is pretty different from the Avant. And I think that's a good thing because the oh, Avant yeah. isn't gonna be the perfect knife for everybody. like. It for me is one of the most perfect knives that I've carried and it ought to be because Ryan and I designed it for ourselves. But yeah, if I were to design a Warney or a Bowie or whatever else, it's going to be pretty different from this because those knives feel like they should be different to me. To me, that's very exciting. I love that. Uh, um, 
I love that. Companies like, um, uh, I mean, w w Giant Mouse popped to mind uh, initially, just like, yeah, they, you know, it's this partnership between these two guys who have very um, distinct, well, in their design work themselves, they have very distinctive styles, but, but together, they work together in such a way that their work is very distinctive, but each knife seems to be different. And each time they have an outing, it's like, yeah, and this is also a kind of knife we really love. Check this out. Yep. And uh, just from the width and breadth of uh, your reviews and seeing what you've liked, uh, you know, I can't think of any particulars, but something surprising. Oh, I thought he was more into this kind of thing, but oh, he likes this. And then to see how, um, how that can actually come out and be a product line, uh, Tops Knives, another one, they have 8 billion different models, each one, so you know, they're, and they're all different. And somehow they all seem to be in stock all the time. But um, to me, that's exciting because if you have faith in the product, um, you can find something that's for you, you know, and I have faith in you and your product. The Avant might not be my thing. And I'm just saying hypothetically, like you said, but man, do I love Warnies or don't I love like little fixed blade knives? And I'm sure you have one of those in the offing. So, um, yeah, to me that, that sort of, uh, well, diversity in your design, that's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a reason why the Avant is the first as well. Like, I don't know that any other knife that comes, I'm hopeful that it will, but I don't know that any other knife that comes will feel just because this is our first, maybe like mm -hmm. that. It'll feel like it's really as accurately an expression, at least for the timestamp, maybe we'll change and our knives will change with that. But for the timestamp, like this knife is so Ryan and I, it's so me and it's so him. I don't mean that like we either of us compromised on it. Like mm -hmm. luckily our, our, the decision-making was incredibly easy between the two of us because we wanted seemingly the exact same thing. And so to come out of it, like this is us as a knife in a lot of ways. Um, and it's as much an expression of things we don't want in knives not being included as much as it is things we do insist should be on a knife being included. I got to ask like what? Jimping. There's no jimping anywhere on the knife. Uh, oh my gosh, me, it keeps falling out of my hands, man. <laughs> yeah, it, someone can at me when that happens. It just, <laughs> when you design ergonomics correctly, I don't believe jimping is necessary. I genuinely don't. And it bugs me when jimping gets put on knives just because everyone puts jimping on knives. Everyone puts jimping right here. Great, cool. For what? On so many knives, it just feels so useless. And if anything, it annoys me because it's uncomfortable to put my thumb there. Whereas like this has a thumb ramp and the ergos are set to go into your palm mm -hmm. and it, it curves in the places where it should curve. And it's supposed to just fit into your hand. And I don't need anything artificial to make it stay there. Like it, it's designed to stay there. And so things like that, where it, it just kind of subtly <laughs> flies in the face of it, like, if, if it's also fair if somebody gets this knife and they say they wish it had jimping because they prefer it and they're used to it and to them it makes them feel a little bit better but not for me and not for ryan like we we were absolutely in agreement that jimping had no place on this knife and i absolutely think it feels more comfortable and better and sleeker without it yeah and it's like so much of knife design to me seems repetitive and a lot of that is really good because there are great things happening in certain designs that get mimicked. And then it's a good feature that gets copy pasted a lot. But yeah. some of those things just get copy pasted because they get copy pasted. And my brain looks for those things both in knives and in the world around me and rejects them. <laughs> I, I yeah, don't yeah. like things that get done just because they keep being done. I want everything to feel intentional. And so a lot of people would look at this knife and they just see it not knowing what our brains did to it, that it's just a, we wanted to design a knife and cool, we did. But really like the people who get me and who give me the space to sit down and just like feature by feature <laughs> walk through and spend an hour with them telling them why we made every decision on this knife. I, I think it's a, a peek into my brain of like the things that I hate and the things that I love and trying to bring them all together in a cohesive way, which isn't easy to do, by the way, like to have a thumb hole and a low key flipper tab that's also hidden while it's open. Like yeah. 
geometrically that's a little difficult but we wanted that and so we made it happen and to have a hollow grind that runs up above the hole and terminates yeah. above like that's that's atypical and they're little things yeah that yeah. are you mentioned a, a crown spine feels like an italian feature yeah. the italians don't have like <laughs> patents on crown I spine <laughs> but I seemingly know. it's like them and chris reeve who do it i did yeah. it like i just i yeah a wire clip is a, a choice that's so utilitarian because no one will argue that a wire clip is the coolest looking clip or that it feels the fanciest, but it's the knife I want to carry. And so it gets the clip that I want to carry the most. And it's like yeah. all of these things that are, are very deliberate, but I could see easily if I didn't know the story of the knife, it, it would just seem like a happenstance of a lot of things. And it wouldn't necessarily seem like that yeah. story that it is. I, I was very impressed with the height of the hollow grind. I got to say, you don't see too many. This is nearly a full height hollow grind. You don't see that too often nope. at all. And I think especially that, when there's a hole, usually they specifically will put the hole above where the hollow grind terminates. Okay. Okay. I see what you mean. It, well, it, it also makes it very gratifying to, to use with the slow roll because your thumb just, I mean, there's all, it creates a ridge basically on the other side of the hole and you're, and your thumb just, you know, uh, has tons of purchase there. Something I, <coughs> excuse me, something I did not mention uh, that it, it was on my mental list of things is the actual blade shape and and the cutting edge itself. Uh, uh, not the cutting edge itself, but the the profile of the cutting edge. I like how much straight you give. Uh, you know, you were talking about Warren Cliffs before and how you and Ryan love Warren Cliffs. Yeah. Well, you're you're giving a lot of. Of course, you don't have the Warren Cliff tip. You have a belly here, so you're you're giving some of that utility, a lot of that utility that you find in the Warren Cliff with just a a perfect belly up here. Yeah. Um, and we were talking about jimping before. Uh, I love jimping. I just like the way it feels. It's it's a tactile thing, but I always feel like it's put in the wrong spots. You need it up here in case you have to grip it like this, and you need it way up here in case you have to do this. Yep. You know, um, the other places are just for uh, emotional support. It's These are because, my. It's because it goes there. That's yeah. Why. It's emotional support jimping. I feel it there. And now I'm a little bit more secure. And I, I feel like this is this cutting experience is going to be OK. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's interesting. You mentioned the blade shape. Like a lot of people look at this blade and they try to say like, is it a drop point? Is it a Tanto? Is it a Japanese Tanto? Is it like, what is it? And I don't even necessarily know what to call it myself. I guess maybe a trailing point would be what I'd call it. But this amount of belly is, is atypical to see there. And it would have been really easy to just make it a Tanto or to make it just a drop point because drop point is the most common blade shape, I think. Mm -hmm. Or we could have done a Warney because we both love Warnies. But it was like that flat was often what we both love about Warren Cliffs. And what's also nice about Warren Cliffs is when you have the tip down here, if you're cutting down into material, you don't have to pivot all the way to the actual tip to draw through stuff. You right. can just use that. And with an abrupt enough belly, you can still do that pretty well. I use this knife that way a lot, cutting through packaging and tape on top of a box and stuff where I'm just like this pulling through, right? Yeah. And it's so, almost like a Tanto a secondary tip there. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. But yeah, we didn't, uh, neither of us felt like the knife felt like it should be a traditional Tanto, either Japanese or American. It, it didn't have the same ring to it as it does with this blade shape. And it just, whether other people like it or not, when Ryan and I look at this blade shape, we love the way it looks. And and so it's like, again, it's just a, a decision that was completely selfish for Ryan and I which this knife is riddled with it. There was no consideration for like, how will this knife be received as we were designing it? It was just, what do we want come what may? And then once it became real enough, it was like, now let's see if other people want it too. And we're lucky that at least 300 people <laughs> said yeah. they wanted it too. Um, and that may be as far as it ever goes. And if that's the case, we will still be very happy that we, did this but it seemed we we have bigger plans than that i'm not trying to sell ourselves too short but yeah well i think you know it's gonna it's it, it's gonna have way longer legs than just the avant i mean this is such a great uh first you know uh a debut knife um 
So uh, what what's I, I know you don't want to give up uh, details about what's coming next, but um, I know you want to make a Warren Cliff. Uh, do you have any um, plans to make uh, a, a fixed blade and and what what kind of, you know, in the general area, what kind of you thinking uh, in terms of? Yeah. So Ryan and I are both hungry. Um, and we have some other designs. The design that we're actually most primed to do next isn't a Warney, oddly enough. I think a lot of people would expect our next knife to be a Warney. And we also, we're, we're tossing some more Cliff designs <laughs> uh, back and forth right now. We have a lot of fun Zoom calls where it's just a party, the two of us, when we're <laughs> designing knives, because it's fun. It's, it's a hobby as much as it's a thing that we're doing professionally now. Um, we haven't, in the confines of Luft, we haven't started a fixed blade yet. Um, I'm confident that we will at some point. I do think also not to like try to separate myself from Ryan in any weird way, but there will be some knives that I intend to design just as bearded gear. Um, you mentioned giant mouse being mm -hmm. similar to us in some ways, it, both Vox Nays and Anso also do solo stuff while collaborating within giant mouse. And so I think Ryan and I will have a relationship similar to that. So I would say probably the most the, the soonest you'll see a fixed blade that'll be my design will probably be a just me fixed blade. Gotcha. Um, I don't have anything officially working yet, but I have a lot of drawings that I'm excited about um, and potential people to partner with on doing that. So again, none of it's cool. sure yet, but there will probably be some, I don't know whether I'll just go under bearded gear for a knife design that I do, or I'll create some other persona around knife design for me personally, but there's going to be a number of folders that are certainly going to happen from left because we're passionate enough that we're going to make them happen. Um, and then there will probably be fixed blades in that lineup as well. And we'll see what happens on solo design, but there's, there's stuff in the works. There's a lot of drawings that feel good and that I've poured myself into. Well, Jake, it sounds like uh, your approach is very much like an artist. The two of you, you know, um, I'm doing what I'm going to do. And man, I hope people like it because as soon as you start doing things for everyone else, boy, that, that kitchen gets crowded with chefs and man, you, you end up with something no one likes. Yeah. So I, I think your approach is bold and I think it's great. And I think that you, uh, come from a, well, you come from a great background because you, you know, all, you know, what's out there, you know, you've developed your taste. It's, uh, you know, and it's become a part of your vision. Um, so how should people get in touch with you if they've heard this and they're interested in getting a Luft knife or how do people, uh, you know, get on your, your lists and all this, uh, tell people how to get in touch. Sure. So first of all, for Luft Concepts, we have a website. Um, it's just leftconcepts.com and very easy to find in that way. There is a way to sign up to get email updates on there. We don't spam people. We don't send a whole ton of things. Uh, right now we're in a waiting period, so no one's getting any emails for a while unless there's a significant update in production. Um, but that's a good place if you want to be plugged in for left specific information. We also have an Instagram just at left concepts. Um, and so both of those places we're posting intermittently and you can get updates in that way. I will say if so, like I mentioned earlier, the pre-order has sold out. Um, the way we made it work without getting too into details and specifics here, we sold 300 units, 150 of each variant um, in that pre-order. And then beyond that, we have another total of 100 units that we've ordered that are specifically for retailers. So we haven't announced our retailer list yet. Some of it's still up in the air. This is our first time. So we're, we're figuring all of that out. Um, but there's an additional hundred units that when all the knives arrive will be for sale, whether it's all through retailers or some are through our site, we'll figure that out. The people who pre-ordered are going to get some extra fun stuff in their boxes. Um, and they saved just a little bit for giving us their money to hold on to for months and months while they wait for their knife. So there was incentive to pre-order, but if you missed it and you're like kicking yourself, um, which we get messages a lot now of like, when's the next pre-order, which is always the way it's going to go. Um, there will be a hundred units that aren't yet spoken for. So that's another thing. And then there will be more iterations of the Avant down the line. We may never do this exact specification again. We may, um, there will probably be some that will specifically deliberately say, this is the only time we'll do this variation just because we have fun with that kind of stuff. But 
there will be more. So leftconcepts.com at leftconcepts on Instagram, best places to follow us. Um, for me personally, it's bearded gear on YouTube. And then on Instagram, it's bearded underscore gear. Same thing. I think if you search bearded gear without the underscore, I'll still come up. So that's where to find me. And uh, yeah, and Ryan, my partner is at Rimmer Designs, R-I-M-M-E-R Designs on Instagram. And that's where he does a lot of his making and those worry donuts and all kinds of fun stuff. So Great. Well, okay. So keep your eyes peeled on LuftConcepts.com and LuftConcepts on Instagram for uh, when those 100 knives will be distributed to various retailers. And I'm sure they're going to sell like hotcakes. Jake, thank okay. you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. Uh, it's always a pleasure. And uh, this is really exciting. So um, uh, congratulations and best of luck with this endeavor. I appreciate it, Bob. The pleasure is genuinely all mine. And Jim, the unsung hero. Thank you both. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate you for having me. Our pleasure. Take care, sir. Have a knife you want featured or reviewed? Call the Knife Junkies 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and let us know. You just have to hear this one more time. Oh, wait. Sorry. I didn't do that right. You hear the ting? This this knife has an amazing sound, and it probably does not come through. Uh, but very exciting to talk with Jake Bearded Gear uh, to uh, about the Luft Concepts knife company and especially the Avant. It's It's been a, a real pleasure to have this uh, in my office for the past week. And as I promised him, I am going to take it out and about on the town over the next week before I send it back to him with a tear in my eye. Uh, be sure to uh, go to luftconcepts.com and also check them out on Instagram, like, like Jake mentioned, and you will be able to find out when those 100 knives uh, beyond the pre-order are out and distributed to... Um, retailers so you can get one yourself you will not be sorry that is for sure be sure to check us out uh, next week uh, for another great interview and also wednesday for the midweek supplemental thursday night of course is our live stream come join us just go to the knife junkie.com slash join and you can be on screen with us and chat knives so i think that about does it for jim working his magic behind the switcher i'm bob demarco saying until next time don't take dull for an answer Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.